Our opening speaker this morning is a number one New York Times bestseller, author, and international lecturer. Blind since birth, he survived the 9-11 attacks with the help of his guide dog, Roselle. He gives hundreds of presentations around the world each year, speaking to influential groups such as ExxonMobil, AT&T, Federal Express, Scripps College, Rutgers University, Children's Hospital, and the American Red Cross, to name a few. He is the ambassador for the National Braille Literacy Campaign for the National Foundation of the Blind and serves as ambassador for the American Humane Society Association's 2012 Hero Dog Awards. In countless TV and radio appearances, feature articles, and speaking engagements, he does much more than simply tell his own 9-11 story. He continuously explores the broader lessons of life and experiences. The story of teamwork and his indomitable will to live and thrive is the subject of his best-selling book, Thunder Dog. Please join me this morning in welcoming Mr. Michael Hingston. Now all we need is a mic. There we go. Oops. So I've got a testing. There we go. It's starting. No, nope, not yet. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we're good. Technology, right? I'm really honored to be here to speak to all of you from Ohio Health. Been looking forward to this for quite a while. Let me begin by introducing you to my colleague. This is Alamo. Alamo, turn around. Look at them. Good boy. Alamo is three years, four days old. And he is a black lab who has now been doing this for a year and is already, there he is. Who's, well, you gotta praise him for doing good work. And he is um, already bored by hearing these speeches, so he'll probably fall asleep down. <clears throat> so I'm curious just to learn a little bit about all of you. How many of you are, are here from just the Columbus area? Or how many of you are, it's a little late for that because I know some of you didn't applaud. How many of you think that it's a great idea when a blind person asks you a question that you answer by raising your hands? <laughs> <clears throat> Which brings me to Stacy. Stacy will be glad to give you lessons on how to walk properly like normal people so you won't fall when you trip over dog toys. <laughs> Some of us have lots of dog toys around our house, and they don't stay in the same place. And a certain person down here is the one who usually moves them. So you learn pretty quickly not to stumble on dog toys. Whoops. You learn pretty quickly not to stumble on dog toys, and, uh, or at least not to fall when you stumble on dog toys. So. Today, what are we going to talk about? Well, um, I, a lot of things. I want to show you some interesting technology a little bit later regarding blindness and blind people. I want to talk to you about what it means to be blind a little bit. And I want to tell you why I want to talk about all those things. So let's start with the why. What I want you to leave hearing this discussion I want you to go away understanding that blindness is not the issue that I really face. A lack of eyesight doesn't really present the problems that most people think it does. And if you truly understand that, it will make your jobs easier when, on those occasions it occurs, you encounter a blind person. Because people think that because you can't see, you really can't do things that everyone else can do. You can't do them as well and probably can't do them at all. But the problem is that's not true. The problem is that you think you have to have eyesight to do things. Oh, OK, I'm not going to drive a car today. On the other hand, the main reason that I can't drive a car is that no one spent the time developing the technology that would allow me to drive a car effectively. And I'm not talking about autonomous vehicles. I'm instead talking about driving a car like you do, although hopefully better, because the way most people drive today, I'm not sure I want to be on the road as a driver. 
On the other hand, given the insurance industry and that it concentrates on doing everything through actuarial statistics and evidentiary data, I submit that if you go look in any files of any insurance company, you will find fewer blind drivers have accidents than sighted drivers by far. So I really think that we are much safer on the road than all of you. But suffice it to say that in reality, the technology does exist for a blind person to truly drive a car. If you get a chance, go visit blinddriverchallenge.org. That's blinddriverchallenge.org. If you go to that website and watch the videos, you will see a blind man driving a Ford Escape in 2011 around the Daytona Speedway right before the Rolex 24 race. He was not receiving any instructions from sighted people, but rather receiving information to allow him to avoid obstacles, uh, pass through obstacle courses and so on, strictly from the technology that was built into the vehicle. Technology that probably only cost a few hundred dollars, but technology that truly allowed him to drive the car. It's not ready for prime time, but the technology exists. Blindness isn't the problem. It's our attitudes about blindness that tend to be the problem. And most all of us who are blind are victims of that attitude. I was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1950. My mother had a high school education, my father an eighth grade education. And about four months after I was born, it was discovered that I was blind. <clears throat> Although medical science had begun to recognize the, the realities of the day, most medical science people had not realized that too much oxygen given to a premature baby can be a bad thing. And in reality, in my case, it caused the retinas to malform due to a condition that used to be called retrolentral fibroplasia and a condition that's now called retinopathy or prematurity. Still have never gotten a great explanation for why they changed the name, but it's probably a little easier to spell. Speaking of that, I will tell you that um, you, you heard mentioned that we wrote a book called Thunderdog. And we have copies of Thunderdog that I will, will be selling outside afterward. And there's a table, we're gonna be here all day. Uh, Alamo has asked me to tell you that we really would appreciate you coming. The first 144 of you who come can buy a copy of the book. Um, Alamo would really appreciate it. He told me that we're really running low on kibbles and we need funds to go buy kibbles tonight. And he would hope that all of you would take pity on him because he doesn't want to starve. <laughs> and he wants to be able to get home and do a good job of guiding, so please come and buy books. And besides that, you can learn how to spell retrolentral fibroplasia and retinopathy or prematurity if you buy the book, for those of you who don't know how to spell them. In any case, it was discovered that I was blind at about four months of age, and the learned medical profession in Chicago told my parents to send me to a home for handicapped people because no blind child could ever grow up and be a contributor to society. Blind kids can't do anything. And my parents needed to come to terms with that reality. My parents told the learned experts in Chicago they were wrong that in fact, as far as they were concerned, I could do whatever I chose to do with my life. And the doctor said, but all he's going to do is suck up all the love, I don't know whether they use those terms exactly, but suck up all the love that you have and your two-year-old son, my sighted brother, would not receive the love that he deserves and that the best thing they could do is to send me away. And my parents said, we can love two children, whether one is blind or not, just as easily as we could love one. And they took me home. And I grew up believing that as a blind person, I could do whatever I chose. In fact, when I was growing up in Chicago, which I did for five years, south side of Chicago, really tough neighborhood. You know, in our neighborhood, they didn't ask you what time it was, they stole your watch, you know what I'm saying? It was a tough neighborhood. But in my neighborhood, um, I did everything that all the other kids did. I went to the candy store and so on. And at the age of four, I went to kindergarten because in Chicago we started kindergarten at four. My parents had advocated with others to have a special class for blind kids uh, who were going into kindergarten. And the reason they did that is it turns out there were a whole lot of preemies who were losing or who had lost their eyesight at birth. In fact, there were so many premature children born who became blind due to too much oxygen that in the 10 years from 1945 roughly until 1955, 
the number of children born was so large that it actually brought the age of blind people, the average age in this country, down by two years. It's a significant number of people. So I went home and did everything, went to the candy store, started kindergarten, actually learned Braille, the rudiments of Braille in kindergarten. But then at the age of five, we moved to California because my father got a job out in California. He had, up until that time, been a co-owner of a business to repair televisions. We don't have TV repair today. We buy a new TV when it breaks. Back then, if a tube broke, anybody know what a vacuum tube is? Um, if a vacuum tube uh, died and burned out or whatever, the TV repair guy would come out and, and put a new one in. Not today. But in any case, my father got a job in California and we moved. And because of the advanced educational system in California, which starts kindergarten when you're five instead of four, I was not allowed to go into first grade but had to take a second year of kindergarten. Go figure. But it wasn't really fun because where I grew up in a little a uh, suburban, a rural town actually called Palmdale, California. We did not have any programs for blind kids. So mostly in kindergarten, I kind of sat around. I listened to the things that the teacher said, and I hung on every word, and I learned a lot from that. But then when there were activities like drawing and all that, I didn't get to participate in any of those things. But you know, I really didn't worry about it because I wasn't interested in all that stuff. Already at that age, I had become interested in science and mathematics and so on. And as I went into first grade, my parents helped me with homework, my father with math and science and so on, because his job was a, a result of him becoming a self-taught electronics and electrical engineer. And he worked on advanced test equipment and other kinds of technologies in the Palmdale and then later at the Edwards Air Force Base, where all of the early space shuttle technologies and rocket planes were built and tested, and he was very much involved with that. He worked with people like Neil Armstrong on some of the, the, the things that they did and, and calibrated, and his job was to calibrate all of the test equipment and be in charge of that lab. In any case, I didn't get all of the, the same opportunities as my peers in first grade because I couldn't read books, we didn't have books, and I didn't know Braille well enough, and we didn't have anybody in the school district to order Braille books. So the result of all that was that I did all of my homework orally with my parents. I learned to do math in my head. I was doing algebra when I was six. I was uh, able to spell words. I learned to public speak very early when it came to that because back in those days, I don't even know how they do it today, but back in the days when I was in first grade, when on Fridays we would take our spelling tests the teacher would say a word, everybody had to write down the word, and then at the end, they would exchange papers, and then somebody would come and write the words on the board, or the teacher would write the words on the board so you get the correct spelling and could grade your classmate's paper. Not in my class. The blind guy had to verbally spell the words out loud, so I had to really work hard to make sure that I knew how to spell all the words because I didn't want to get embarrassed in front of all of my classmates by misspelling words. Once I did, but only once. My wife is not convinced of that today, sometimes having seen my typing, but I'm telling her that, that spell checker with Microsoft Word is getting better. But I, uh, but I did participate by spelling all the words out loud. <clears throat> so I guess that was the introduction to public speaking. Well, first, second, and third grade went along, and then between third and fourth grade, we learned that there, in fact, would be a person hired because there were a number of people in the Antelope Valley where I grew up, and so a person was going to be hired to be a resource teacher for the blind kids in the area. And so my mother and father purchased a Braille writing device, a Braille writer, and I started to learn Braille again from my mom over the summer. We worked for a couple of hours every day on various exercises. So by the time I went into the fourth grade, I wasn't reading at fourth grade level from a speed standpoint, but I knew Braille. And by the end of the fourth grade, I was certainly reading at a decent level because the teacher, Mrs. Hirschberger, in fact, was able to work with the district to make sure that I had Braille copies of the textbooks that everyone else was using. So we went through fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Along the way, we met, uh, we, we read about a teacher at Edwards Air Force Base who was blind and who had been hired to teach the 
children on base of all of the military people. And this woman um, was written up in one of the papers. My dad brought the article home. The woman had a guide dog, a German shepherd named Nola. And we decided we ought to meet her. And I ought to meet this person who could be a role model. So we contacted her. And one day, she and her, her friend um, came and visited us. So Sharon Gold was her name, and her friend was Cheryl Pickering. And Sharon and Cheryl came, and, um, and the, we all talked. And I got to meet her guide dog, which was a really neat thing, because big German shepherds are kind of cool. And she started giving my parents and me a lot of advice about what to do as I grew up as a blind child. <clears throat> By the time I was in the eighth grade, now participating fully, <clears throat> now having learned to type so I could type answers to tests uh, where, where typing was appropriate, I was able to, to function and be a full participant in classes. And it's still, never really thought much about being blind. Oh, yeah, I was a little bit different and did things different ways, but just didn't worry about it. And I'm sure there were things that I didn't know that other kids did because they could see them. Because, in fact, we live in a visually centric world. We live in a world that doesn't create material in an inclusive way for me to get access to it. That's the real issue. It isn't that I can't deal with things. It is that we don't make material available in an inclusive way, and that tends to be the real problem. Well, in any case, as we went through the eighth grade, going on toward high school, my parents and I talked about the fact that I really needed to be able to do a better job of traveling around. I didn't use a white cane back in those days. We didn't even know what they were. Well, at least we didn't. They were around. But uh, I never learned to use one, but I learned to travel around my neighborhood. In fact, I could walk around my neighborhood without any difficulty. My brother and I delivered papers. I rode a bike on a regular basis around the neighborhood, drove the neighbors crazy. One day I remember coming in from riding my bike and I was walking in the door after putting the bike in the garage and uh, the phone rang. My dad answered, dad answered the phone and the conversation as I pieced it together later went something like this. My dad answered and this guy on the other end said, I'm calling you about your kid who was out riding his bike. And my dad said, no, oh, okay, what about it? Well, he was out riding his bike. And my dad said, well, yeah, okay, what about it? No, 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 I'm not talking about the kid who can see. I'm talking about the younger one, the blind kid. He was out riding his bike. And my dad said, yeah, okay, but he's blind. And my dad said, well, so? But, but he can't ride a bike. Well, you just said he was out riding his bike, didn't you? <laughs> well, but, but, he, but he's blind, he can't do that. And my dad said, well, <clears throat> did, he, did he hit anyone? <clears throat> no. Uh, did anyone hit him or anything? No. Well, did he hit any cars? Uh, well, well, no. Well, did, did, um, did any cars hit him? Did he get in any cars' ways or anything like that? And the guy said, well, no. And I did, so my dad said, well, so what's the problem? And the guy hung up. <laughs> he could not com comprehend or cope with the fact that a blind child could ride a bike. It doesn't necessarily take eyesight to do it. It takes being able to hear. It takes being able to use your wits. But I guarantee you, as we say down in Nolens, that a blind child can ride a bike. I know lots of them who ride bikes. <clears throat> it isn't magical. You learn the techniques. The problem is we as a society don't recognize that those techniques exist. And I'm going to keep coming back to that theme because it's really important for you to understand in all that you do. There are blind people who have been doctors in the medical profession. One of the most famous in some quarters is a gentleman named Jacob Balotin, who in the early 1900s was a cardiac surgeon, and he was blind. He was very successful. He was at the head of cardiac surgery at a hospital in Chicago until he passed away. Blindness isn't the problem. There is a brain surgeon. And some of the people in the medical profession uh, couldn't cope with the fact that there was a blind person who could do brain surgery, but his patients loved him because he was more interactive with them and connected with them more than a lot of doctors do. No offense to anyone in this room. Blindness, though, isn't the problem if someone learns the appropriate techniques and develops the appropriate attitude about blindness. Well, anyway, back to the eighth grade. 
My parents decided to apply so that I could get a guide dog. Now, the normal age to get a guide dog was 16 back in those days. But for whatever reason and however articulate my parents were, <coughs> excuse me, I was out on the playground one day jumping rope because I didn't get to participate in baseball and all those other PE things. So my exercise was jumping rope and sometimes running laps with the other kids around the track because I could hear them and follow them. But this guy comes up to me and he says, are you Michael Hinkson? And I said, yeah. And he said, my name is Larry Reese. I'm from Guide Dogs for the Blind in San Rafael, California, and I'm here to tell you that you're going to be in our class this summer, and I wanted to meet you. And that was how I learned that I had been accepted to go get a guide dog at the age of 14. And that summer, I went and got my first guide dog, Squire, a golden retriever, came home, went to high school, and went through high school just like everyone else. It was a much bigger school and a lot more obstacles, but Squire did what he was supposed to do. So what does a guide dog do? What a guide dog does is not what most people think. The dog doesn't know where I want to go, nor does the dog know how I want to get there. The purpose of the dog is to follow directions so that when I say forward, the dog will go forward if it can. If I say left, the dog will go left. Right, the dog will go right until it can. not and then if it stops, I have to figure out what the problem is. Or if we come to a street corner and the dog stops, I listen to the way the traffic is going. And being a reasonably sensible kind of guy, I know that if traffic is going across in front of me, it's probably not a good idea to step out into the street. Because there's a decent chance that some car might decide to hit me. Because there is something to be said about classical mechanics and that two different pieces of matter can't occupy the same space at the same time. We're not going to get into a discussion of Schrodinger's wave equation or, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and quantum mechanics here. I could, but I won't. So I wait till the traffic is going the same way I want to go, and then I cross the street. I'll tell the dog forward. And as we're crossing the street, if suddenly the dog jerks back or whatever, I'm going to follow that dog. I'm not going to question, well, come on, keep going across the street. I'm going to follow the dog because the odds are incredibly high that the dog saw a car that I didn't hear, or in today's world, the dog saw a hybrid vehicle that was running on electric power, or a Tesla, and was running on electric power, and I wouldn't even be able to hear it, and the dog is backing us out of the way. If, on the other hand, we discover later that that wasn't really what was going on, and that the dog saw a duck and wanted to go play with it, I guarantee you the team will have a meeting and one of the team members is going to have to answer for their actions. And, and make no mistake, we're a team. We each have a job to do. The dog's job is to keep me safe, not to know where I want to go. I need to know where I want to go and how to get there. And then I direct the dog. So my job is to be the navigator. The dog's job is to be the pilot <clears throat> and to get us where we want to go safely. And I need to tell the dog where to go. So we went through high school. I also learned along the way that Squire, my golden retriever friend, was great at clearing sidewalks. In our school, we had a rule that for girls, dresses were to be worn and had to be two inches above to two inches below the knees. One day we were walking down a sidewalk, minding our own business, and we came up to this crowd of people. A bunch of girls were talking and other people were around. And I don't know how it happened, but Squire's cold nose touched a bare leg. You never saw a sidewalk clear so fast. I'm sure I almost got slapped several times, and then they saw the dog and thought, oh, what a cute dog. Anyway, it wasn't long before someone always kept an eye out, and any time we came down the sidewalk, it par the people parted like the Red Sea because cold nose Squire was coming through. And we always had clear sidewalks for the rest of the three and a half years or so I was in high school. But another thing happened in my freshman year. The superintendent learned that I was riding the school bus. And the superintendent of the school system contacted the, the school where I went to school, redundant there, and said, we have a rule in our school district that says no live animals are allowed on school buses. And so this, this blind kid with his dog can't ride on the bus because no live animals are allowed on the bus. Now, I learned when I was at Guide Dogs for the Blind that we had a state law in the penal code of the state of California, section 643.5 at the time, it's now changed, 
but section 643.5 was real clear, among other things, in saying that any blind person with a guide dog could ride any common carrier, and that uh, if you research it under the law, school buses are classified as common carriers. So it meant that I was allowed on the bus, but the superintendent said no, and so suddenly I wasn't allowed to ride the school bus, but the district hired somebody to take me to school, which to my way of thinking meant that their vehicle was under the same laws as any school bus, go figure. However, um, the superintendent was firm, and so my father demanded a meeting with the school board. Now, we learned along the way that the chair of the school board, we knew this actually before we demanded the meeting, but we learned that the chair of the school board was a lawyer, a gentleman, in fact, who participated as the master of ceremonies at my Boy Scout Star Court of Honor on my way to becoming an Eagle Scout with two palms and vigil in the order of the arrow, I will point out. But he, he was the, the master of ceremonies of our Star, Star Scout Court of Honor, which meant that we knew Mr. Cartosian. Well, my dad demanded the board meeting, went to the library, researched the law and all that sort of stuff, and came back and said, this case is real easy, and he talked all about the common carriers and all sorts of stuff like that. And the day of the board meeting came, we went to the board meeting, they did some of their business, and then after that, the, the chair of the board, Mr. Cartosian, uh, announced that we were gonna hear this case, and the superintendent got up and said, this is real easy, we have a rule, no live animals allowed on the school bus. This, Blind child has a guide dog and the guide dog is alive, so the guide dog can't ride on the school bus, so the, the child can't ride on the school bus. And he sat down, and Mr. Cartosian turned to my father and said, Mr. Hinkson, do you have anything that you wanna say about this? And my dad said, yeah. The superintendent is absolutely right. This is a very simple case. Here's the deal. Section 643.5 of the Penal Code of the State of California says that my child can take his guide dog on any public conveyance, in any public place, any lodging, uh, hotel, motel, diner, restaurant, and on any common carrier, and according to Black's Law Dictionary, school buses under case law are classified as common carriers. So the only question that you all have to answer is, if you decide to support the superintendent, which one of you is gonna pay a $1,000 fine and spend a year in jail? That's the only question you have to answer. The superintendent stood up and arrogantly said, is he right? I remember it. I remember his arrogant, bullying voice. There was a pause. Mr. Cartosian said, yep. And the board voted three to two to support the superintendent. It didn't matter. The board was really saying I wasn't as valuable and the alternative techniques that I used to travel about weren't as valuable as sighted kids. Well, we had met the governor of the state of California the year before at a Boy Scout function, so my father wrote to the governor, spelling out everything that had happened. We don't know what occurred except that the superintendent on a Wednesday was called and summoned to Sacramento. I hear it was a pretty bloody scene. Would have loved to have been a fly on the wall but he was back in his office on Friday and a note went out that said that I would be allowed back on the school buses. I learned two things from that. One, in reality, I was gonna be treated differently simply because I was blind. There would be discrimination and I would have to decide how I was gonna deal with it. I could be bitter about it, I could fight it, I could reject the concept and sometimes lose a battle but never the war. And the other thing I learned is that you can fight City Hall and you can win. And so I went on from there. I had a 3.54, I think it was, grade point average in school. In my freshman year, which were, was normally, from a science standpoint, um, a general science course, the general science teacher came up to me one day, he says, you're pretty bored, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I was already building radios on my own, and of course I told you I could do math and all that in my head. He said, I worked it out with Mr. McGregor, who's the teacher who runs senior physics, and we're gonna put you in the senior physics course for your last quarter, which was really hugely different from general science, but I still got an A. I went through high school, <clears throat> went to college at the University of California at Irvine, Go Ant Eaters! Hey, we made it to the final 64 this year. 
One game, but we still made it. Progress. And I um, began to study physics at the college level. I always uh, passed with pretty decent grades. I think my grade point average was, again, above 3.54, 3.55 in my four years of undergraduate work. I stayed there to do graduate work, and the uh, grade point average was like 3.8 in physics. Also worked at the campus radio station for six years. 60 Minutes had come on by that time. My show was on from 6 to 9 every Sunday, so I never got to watch 60 Minutes. I heard about this guy, Mike Wallace, who grilled everybody. Didn't worry me a bit. Um, Mike Wallace, as I learned, was an old radio announcer, and he announced radio shows like The Green Hornet and all those other crime things. So I knew Wallace was clearly a guy who just liked to associate with criminals, so he didn't scare me. <laughs> but um, I, I worked at the campus radio station, did all the things that everyone else would do at college, and graduated, went to graduate school, also got a, high uh, a secondary teaching credential from the Irvine College of Education. And in 1976, I went looking for a job, and by that time, the National Federation of the Blind, the largest organization of blind consumers, had begun working with a guy named Ray Kurzweil. Ray was a gentleman who had developed technology that could scan any printed material, typed material, or a combination of the two, and read it out loud. And the Federation worked with Ray to perfect the technology, and after college, I was hired to travel around the country to set up machines that we purchased to take out of his lab, out of Ray's lab, prototype machines. I would set them up. I would teach people how to use the machines. I would teach people how to um, operate all the different controls. I wrote training curriculum. I observed how people use the machines. And eventually, at the end of 18 months, wrote a report telling Ray Kurzweil what needed to be in a final production model of the machine. The result of all that was that I was hired by Kurzweil to come and do the same things internally. But after about six months, I was called into the office of the Vice President of Marketing I by now had moved to Boston, Massachusetts, actually Winthrop, Massachusetts. Ray's offices were in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Took the T in every day, the subway system, and traveled into Cambridge and then home at night and so on. But I was called in and was told I was being laid off. Well, why? Especially since I had done all this work for the last now two years with Ray and so on through the National Federation of the Blind and doing the same things at the company. And Mr. Parsons, the head of marketing, said, well, we got to lay you off because, like a lot of companies, this is an engineering-driven company. We've hired way too many non-revenue producers. And so we're going to have to lay you off because you're not producing money for us. Your work's important, but not as important as making money. And I said, well, OK. Um, really didn't want to get into another job search. Because you see, one of the things that I already knew from working with the National Federation of the Blind, again, the largest organization of blind consumers, is that the unemployment rate among employable blind people in this country was and is close to 70%. It is not that blind people can't do the jobs, it's people think we can't do the jobs because we're blind. Big difference. The end result is the same, we don't get jobs and people rationalize it by saying, well, they're blind, they can't do it anyway. Nothing could be further from the truth. So Mr. Parsons said, we're going to have to lay you off. And then he paused and said, unless you'd be willing to go into sales. Now, in reality, I knew that that was an honor because they didn't want to lay me off or they were afraid to lay me off, fearing that it would make the National Federation of the Blind pretty mad. 50,000 blind people is a viable force to reckon with. And he said, we don't want you to sell the product for the blind. We have a new commercial version, and it's going to sell for $125,000, and we want you to sell it. My gosh, I'd never sold in my life before. Well, I had, but not really. So I had this decision to make. I'm a science guy, right? My training is in science. Do I want to lower my standards and go into sales? It took a nanosecond to decide yes, and so I went into sales. Took a Dale Carnegie sales course and began selling. Always achieved goal. Moved on and did things for Kurzweil. In 1981, I was asked to relocate back out to California because I'd lived there. And I was asked to relocate because 
Xerox had expressed an interest in buying Kurzweil, and so I was to go out and kind of help integrate Xerox and Kurzweil and the technologies together with the people at the science end of Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and also to continue to sell. By 1984, the merger had been completed and Xerox had taken over, and my thanks for that was, like all the other pre-Xerox takeover salespeople, I was told my services were no longer needed and summarily dismissed in late June of 1984. And so I was back in a job search mode. Nothing I could do about it. By that time, I had gotten married. I got married to my wife, Karen, in 1982. On November 27, 1982, this year in November, we will have been married 37 years, which is cool. I, I should also tell you that she happens to be a person with a disability. She's in a wheelchair. She's been in a chair her whole life. Great marriage. She reads. I push. Works out well. <laughs> Except that now she uses a power chair. But so I have to watch my toes. But in any case, um, in 1984, I began a job search. And it didn't matter what job I applied for. It didn't matter what my resume showed, how competent I was. If I was blind, they had no interest in talking to me. So in 1985, I started my own company with a couple of other people. And the product that we sold was CAD systems, PC-based CAD systems, computer-aided design, the things that nowadays architects use and engineers use to design houses and products and so on. Back in those days, PC-based CAD was very revolutionary and new. And a blind guy selling CAD systems? Why not? I didn't need to work the machine. What I needed to know was how to work the machine so I could tell other people how to do it, which I learned to do. So I did the CAD sales for, set for four years, and then I sold the company. <clears throat> and after selling it and starting on a job search, one day my wife and I were looking at a newspaper, and we found this job that looked really cool. And we decided that I'd apply for it. But I said, well, Karen, do I say that I'm blind on the cover letter to the resume or not? Because you know the deal is if I don't say I'm blind, I might get an interview. And if I say I'm blind, I probably won't even get an answer back. Well, so Karen said, like only wives can do, you're an idiot. And I said, why? And she said, well, you took that Dale Carnegie sales course. What was the most important thing that you said you learned out of that course. Well, you know, I, I wasn't with her, so I wasn't thinking of what she was thinking of. I said, well, there were lots. Which one are you talking about? And she said, look, you're an idiot. The most important thing you always said, and the thing that you always told everybody after that, that you hired in sales and who you managed, you said that the most important thing that they should understand is that you should always find ways to turn perceived liabilities into assets. Ooh, I was with her. The light bulb went off over my head, just like it does in those cartoons. I heard the switch flip. And I went and I wrote a cover letter. And the last couple paragraphs of the cover letter went like this. The most important thing that you need to know about me when you're considering my application is that I happen to be blind. Because as a blind person, I've had to sell all my life just to survive and function. I've had to sell to convince people to let me buy a house because I'm, while I'm blind. I've had to sell to convince people to let me rent an apartment, take my guide dog on airplanes, into grocery stores, and so on. So, do you want to hire someone for this job who sells for eight or 10 hours a day and then goes home, and that's it? Or do you want to hire somebody who truly understands sales for the science and art that it is, and who sells all the time just as a way of life? I got a phone call inviting me down for an interview because of that letter, and because of that, I got the job. And I went to work for that company in 19, and that was in 1989 and 1996. They asked me to move to the New York area to open an office for them on the East Coast because Wall Street companies wanted manufacturers, and we were a manufacturer, to have their own offices on the East Coast. So we did what Wall Street wanted, and I went and opened an office on the 23rd floor of Tower 2 of the World Trade Center. I worked there for about a year, and then was recruited away, and then recruited away again in 1999 by a company called Quantum Corporation. I had sold some quantum products along the way, and they knew that I was a reasonably talented kind of guy. And they, too, did not have an office in the New York area. And Wall Street had told them that they wanted them to open an office um, in New York because of the fact that they, uh, the Wall Street world 
bought a lot of product from Quantum and its distributors, and the products that they bought were what they used to back up all of their computer data. They would plug our products into the networks and they would back up all of their data every day, more than once a day. The Security and Exchange Commission demanded it. All data, all transactions had to be saved off-site for seven years. So they recorded everything on magnetic tape created by our products that they would buy and put on their networks. So that's what I began to sell. I hired a staff and we were very successful. Our office happened to be on the 78th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. When I went looking for real estate for opening the office, I learned along the way that the World Trade Center back in 2000 was not fully occupied because of the bombing in 1993. It was like an 80% occupancy and that you could probably get a fairly decent deal renting an office there. So I went off and I started kind of chatting with the Port Authority real estate people and so on and we kept going back and forth about what it should cost and I kind of hemmed and hawed and didn't like this number and they wanted me to stay closer to this number and I wouldn't. We finally negotiated a rate where we rented 1,400 square feet of office space on the 78th floor of the World Trade Center at $2 a square foot. $2,800 a month for 1,400 square feet of office space. You can't get an apartment in New York with, with 1,200 square feet of space for under three or $4,000 a month, but we got this great deal. Not only that, it was on what was called a sky lobby, so elevators went straight from the first floor to the 78th floor. No stops in between. Had a lot of fun with that. I kept telling people that when they came, we had reserved a special elevator for them so that they didn't have to stop on the way up. The suckers who didn't even know. Anyway, <laughs> so we opened the office, we set everything up, I hired staff, we continued to do well. And then in August of 2001, one of our major distributors, Ingram Micro, said, you know, we've got a lot of resellers who sell your product, and I, I won't go through the whole distribution process, but um, they said, would you hold some sales seminars to teach people how to sell your product? And I said, sure, we can do that. I called David Frank, who was our head of distribution um, for Quantum, and I said, we're gonna do these seminars. Ingram Micro asked if we would do them. Would you come back and be a part of it? And David said, sure, would love to do that. And David um, came back, or said he would come back, and he would uh, talk about the pricing I was going to be doing all the technical stuff, and my job, of course, as the, um, as the person who would be interacting with these people all the time, I was going to be their technical contact anyway. So we decided that we would hold the seminars, and we decided that we would hold them on, yeah, September 11th, 2001. Like a good scout, the day before the seminars, I took my laptop home, which is where I did all of my work, and I, Last connected. Initializing IRA. Last you'll, you'll hear about that later. Um, so I uh, went home, backed up my data on my home network, because I did that every day anyway, and got ready for bed later that evening and went to bed. Now with my fifth guide dog, Roselle, a yellow lab. Roselle was quite the character, actually. Roselle, for example, loved to steal socks. She didn't chew them up. She stole them and hid them. She thought it was a great game. Anyway, Roselle also was afraid of thunder. Well, that evening we went to bed. Me, my wife Karen, Roselle, my retired guide dog Lenny, who had to retire um, the pre uh, two years, the previous year. And um, at 12:30. Suddenly, Roselle was pushing my hand around, and she was panting heavily and so on, and we knew it was a thunderstorm coming because Roselle was afraid of thunder. And she could tell when a storm was coming. We learned later because the static charge would start to build up on her fur, and it gave her a kind of a creepy feeling on her fur, and that would signal fear because she knew that thunder was going to be on its way. Well, since she detected a storm coming, Roselle and I went down into my office and we stayed there for about an hour and a half as the thunderstorm came 
right over our house. The thunderclap sounded like explosions. It was incredible. So we stayed there. I turned my stereo up as loud as I could. I was producing some things in Braille on my Braille printer just to try to make some noise and, and uh, try to blank out as much of the thunder for her as I could. By 2 o'clock, it was all gone, and we went back up, and we went to bed. At 5 o'clock, got up, went into the office, and started to prepare for the seminar. At 7.40, as I arrived, a gentleman with a big cart arrived. We had ordered food for all the early seminar arrivals and so on, and so they, um, the, the guy came, set up all the, the food, including best ham and cheese croissants in New York City, I'm telling you. Having tried many, the Port Authority had the best. At 8 o'clock, David Frank and some of the early arrivals from Ingram Micro arrived in our office, and um, they started eating breakfast, except for David. David and I went in, and we created a list of all the people who would be coming to seminars that day. Because you see, the Port Authority would only allow you in in one of two ways. Either they could call up, and you'd have to show your ID and give your name, and they would ask if you were welcome. Or we had to create on letterhead a list of the people who would be coming like to our seminars, and we had to fax that to the Port Authority people. We were creating the list. We had just finished creating the list in Excel. And I was reaching for stationery. Any blind people in the room, by the way? OK, well, I'll verbalize anyway, just to keep in practice. But. Um, I was reaching for stationery as I'm reaching out now, and suddenly we heard a muffled explosion. The building kind of shuddered, and then if you imagine my arm as the tower as I tip it toward you, the building started tipping and tipping and tipping and tipping. Now, I had spent a long time learning all that I could about how to function in the World Trade Center, learning literally how to find any place in the World Trade Center that I could. Um, as I love to tell people, you could drug me in if, when I woke up I was in the World Trade Center. It would only take me about five seconds to know where I was because I knew the buildings that well. But in this case, um, well, I didn't totally understand what was happening as the building tipped. We did know that tall buildings, like 110-story buildings, are very flexible. They're made to sway in windstorms. So it was tipping and tipping and tipping. But the building was struck 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. So of course, we had no real idea what was going on. None of us did. Well, the building kept tipping. David said, what's going on? Is it an earthquake? What do you want? He's from the Bronx. He wouldn't know. I said, no, the building's not shaking around. It's going in one direction. Maybe it was an explosion. He said, well, I didn't really hear a loud explosion. He was right. So we had no clue. What I did know is, having grown up in Palmdale, California, building moves go stand in doorway. So I did. I went and stood in the doorway between my office and the uh, reception area. Yeah, a really safe place to be. 78 floors up, it's going to make a big difference. But that's where I stood anyway. And finally, David and I said goodbye to each other because we thought we were about to take a 78 floor plunge to the street. And then the building stopped. And it started moving back the other way. And I didn't even know I was holding my breath until I let it out as the building started to come back. And finally, it got to be vertical again. And as soon as it was vertical, I went back into my office and I met Roselle, who was under my desk. She was coming out from under my desk. David was just holding onto my desk. And um, I took Roselle's leash. I told her to heal, which meant to come around on my left side and sit just like Alamo did. Good boy. He likes that. And about that time, the building dropped straight down about six feet. I wasn't really thinking about everything that I had learned, but I knew that tall buildings like that were, as I said before, able to sway. What really was going on is when the plane hit the building, the expansion joints expanded, allowing the building to flex. And then when it got to be vertical again, the expansion joints dropped back down to their normal configuration, and that's what happened. The building did everything it was supposed to do. As soon as the building stopped moving, David turned and looked out the window and started shouting, oh my god, Mike, there's fire and smoke above us. We got millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside the window. We can't stay here. We got to get out of here right now. I heard debris falling outside the window or going by our windows and scraping along the wall. I didn't know what it was, but now I did. David told me. 
we got to get out of here. And I said, slow down, David. You see, one of the things that I learned all about the World Trade Center when I was understanding and trying to make sure that I knew everything that I could know, because I might be the only one in my office if there were an emergency, because my sales staff was supposed to be out selling and supporting their manager, right? So the only time I wasn't in the office was I was out on sales calls with them or if I decided to work from home. But of course, that day I was in the office. My sales staff wasn't. My support staff wasn't. The only other kind of quantum guy who was there was David, and he didn't spend time in that office all the time. So I needed to know what to do. I learned what the emergency evacuation procedures were. I learned everything I could about what to do in an emergency. And I developed a mindset, essentially. Every day I thought about, what do I do if there's an emergency today? I thought that a lot. And I think that prepared me to be able to say to David, slow down. Don't worry about it. We're going to get out. Just don't worry. We'll evacuate. No, we got to get out of here right now. The building's on fire. I can see fire above us. And there are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside our window. Our guests began to scream. They started moving toward the exit. And I kept saying, slow down, David. And I think that slowed them down. And they stopped to wait. And David so we got, said, we got to get out of here. We can't stay here. Slow down, David. You got the picture, don't you? The sighted guy seeing all this horrible stuff going on outside and the blind guy saying, slow down. The problem wasn't what I wasn't seeing. And David finally said, you don't understand. You can't see it. The big line. <coughs> the problem wasn't what David wasn't seeing or what, what I wasn't seeing. It was what David wasn't seeing. The problem was that David wasn't seeing that there was this dog sitting next to me, wagging her tail and yawning and going, who woke me up? Let's go play. I'm bored and I want to do something and not giving any indication of fear whatsoever. And you know that I know what it's like when Roselle's afraid because we talked about what happens with thunderstorms and so on. She wasn't giving me any indication that she was afraid. You've read articles about animals who get their humans out from horrible situations. Well, so the bottom line is that we needed to leave, but I got David finally to focus. I said, get our guest to the stairs, then come back and we'll evacuate. He did. I called Karen, told her that we were leaving the building. Something had happened, an explosion or something, and she wanted to know more. And I didn't know more. It was long before the media got the story. <coughs> David came back, we went to the stairs, and we started down. Almost immediately, now it was about 8.50 in the morning, I began smelling an odor, and it took me a few floors to realize I was smelling the fumes from burning jet fuel. I traveled about 100,000 miles a year for my company, so I went to lots of airports. I knew the smells, but it took me a few, a few floors to realize I was smelling burning jet fuel because I never expected to smell it around the World Trade Center. But when I recognized what it was, I said to people around me, I'm smelling burning jet fuel, and they said, that's what it is. We couldn't figure it out. We must have been hit by an airplane. I love talking to reporters because reporters always say, well, of course, you didn't know what happened. You couldn't see it. Excuse me. The airplane hit 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. I couldn't see it. <clears throat> the last I heard, nobody had truly invented x-ray vision yet. Nobody could see it. Nobody where I was in the building knew what was going on. So we kept going down. Burn victims passed us on the stairs. At the 50th floor, David suddenly said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. And I just said in my sharpest, loudest, authoritarian voice, stop it, David. If Roselle and I can go down these stairs, so can you. Because what I was doing with Roselle was telling her, what a good dog, good girl, keep going. What a good dog. And praising her because I didn't want her to think I was nervous. And I didn't want David to start to panic. We all worked to try to keep anyone who was panicking from going over the edge. David told me that brought him out of his funk, and one of the things that he then did was to walk a floor below me. He said, I ought to keep my mind on something else, so I'm going to walk below you, and I'll shout up everything I see on the stairwell. Hey, Mike, he said when I heard him first, I'm at the 48th floor. All's good here. Going on down. <coughs> I didn't realize it at the time, but as I thought about it later, David did one of the most cool things I think I saw that day and probably one of the most important things. 47th floor, all good. Hey, I'm at 46, we're going on down. David became a beacon for anyone who could hear his voice. Everyone knew somewhere on the stairs, 45th floor, all clear, going down. Everyone knew that there was someone who was okay. They had something to focus on. Whether he realized it or not, he 
kept a lot of people focused. 44th floor, hey, this is where the Port Authority cafeteria is, not stopping, going on down. <laughs> and he kept going. And he kept describing. We finally got to the 30th floor, I was on 31, David said, hey, I see firefighters coming up the stairs, we got to let them by. The first guy comes up to me and stops right in front of me and in this loud voice, hey, buddy, you okay? I guess you got to talk loud if you're talking to a blind person, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, yeah, we're good. Don't worry about it. Well, that's really nice. We're going to send somebody down the stairs with you to make sure you get out. I don't need any help. I'm really good. Well, that's nice, but we're going to send somebody anyway. I didn't want help. I didn't need help. And in fact, it would have been dangerous because I knew what they would probably do. When we got to every flight of steps, somebody would grab my arm and lift me up so I wouldn't fall down the stairs, right? I told the guy, I came down from the 78th floor, we're at 30, I'm really good. Well, that's really nice, but we're going to send somebody with you. I said, I've got my guide dog, we're good. Leave us alone, we're fine. And he said, that's really nice, we're going to send somebody. He starts petting the guide dog. It wasn't the time to give him a lecture. Do not pet guide dog and harness. And everybody in this room, do not pet guide dog and harness. In fact, don't talk to the dog, don't interact with the dog, try not to make eye contact with the dog. When the dog is in harness, the dog is working. Alamo is working, you will only distract him. And my first job when he's distracted is to correct him. And people have said to me, when they've not listened to what I've said and then they've petted him anyway, and I said, don't pet the dog, and they did, and he gets distracted, or many of my dogs have, I will give a jerk on the leash and say, leave it. Oh, well, don't yell at the dog. I'm the one that petted the dog. Yell at me. I said, no, you don't understand. I'm going to deal with him. Then I'll deal with you. <laughs> Do not pet, interact with, or whatever, a guy, dog, and harness, period. Harness is off, different story. So it wasn't a give the, the time to give the guy that lecture, and it wasn't time uh, to give him the lecture about blindness isn't the problem, it's your attitude. I simply said, look, I got my friend David over here who can see we're good. And he turns to David and he goes, you're with him. David goes, yeah, leave him alone, he's fine. And so he said, okay. And then he gave Roselle a few more pats, she gave him some kisses, and he walked on up the stairs, now feeling good. And also possibly having received the last unconditional love he ever got in his life. Why did I really resist? I resisted because I didn't want to break up his team. Those people were all carrying equipment. They had to carry all their equipment up the stairs. I knew it. And I didn't want to break up the team. And then hear later on the news how somebody may have gotten hurt because one of their team members was helping a blind man go down the stairs. That's contributing to every stereotype in the world. And in addition to that, um, that wouldn't make me feel good. And it wasn't necessary. So we continued down the stairs. Firefighters went up. On the 26th floor, somebody started passing up water bottles because it was getting pretty hot with all the bodies on the stairs. And we gave Roselle some water, and David and I had some, and continued on down. And finally, he got to the first floor where he told us that the water sprinklers were creating a curtain across the entrance to the lobby of One World Trade. And then he was gone. We got down. We ran through the water, got into the lobby, which was usually quiet. Now there was this loud noise. Everybody was yelling, go this way. Don't go outside. Don't go that way. Go this way. Don't go outside at all. And this guy comes up to David and me. He said he was with the FBI and he'd get us where we needed to go. And I'm sitting there going, I didn't do it. Um, I, I just said, um, what's, what's going on? And he wouldn't tell us. I love information. I wish I had gotten more information. But he wouldn't tell us. I understand that. So we just followed him. We went through and finally got outside as far away as we could be from the Twin Towers. As we got outside, David looked around and said, Mike, Tower 2 is on fire. And I said, you're sure? Yeah, it's on fire. We had no idea why. We walked over to Broadway. We went north on Broadway, got to Bessie Street, and stopped because David said he could see everything pretty clear in the towers. And he could see the fire in Tower 2, and he wanted to take pictures, which he did. Meanwhile, I tried to call Karen. I couldn't get through. I had just put my phone away, and David was putting his camera away when a police officer yelled, get out of here, it's coming down now. And we heard this rumble that became this deafening roar. It sounded like a combination of a freight train and a waterfall. You could hear glass breaking and metal clattering, and then this, this white noise sound as the building pancaked down. David ran. He was gone. 
I turned with Roselle 180 degrees and started running back the way um, I had come to try to get us out of the area where we were. And David um, was, as I said, gone, so it was just us. <coughs> so we ran and ran and finally got to Fulton Street, the street that we had crossed just a little while before. And as we got to that, we turned right on Fulton and ran for about 25 yards and caught up to David. <coughs> David had just run, not even recognizing that he had left us, but somewhere along the line, he realized it. And when he did, he was gonna come back and find us, but I caught up to him first. <coughs> and so, we continued to run. He apologized. I said, don't worry about it, David. He just apologized, and we kept running, and I, I just kept saying, don't worry about it, David. It's okay. And then suddenly, we were engulfed in the dust cloud. All the dirt and debris, all of the fine particles of Tower 2 collapsed. The air was so thick that I could feel stuff going into my lungs with every breath I took. David told me the air was so thick with dirt and debris and dust that he couldn't see his hand six inches in front of his nose. What I did know was that that was such a dangerous area and we were inhaling so much stuff that we were gonna suffocate if we didn't get out of it. So I started telling Roselle as we ran, right, right, right. I wanted her to go to the first opening that she could see and we would go inside the building just to get out of that stuff. It didn't matter that Tower 2 was collapsing. Right now we were okay and we had to get out of that dust cloud. So we ran and suddenly I heard an opening and Roselle obviously did see my hand signals or heard my voice. She turned right, she took one step, stopped, and wouldn't go on. Upon investigation, it turns out that she had stopped at the top of a flight of stairs. She did her job absolutely perfectly. We stopped there, she got a hug, then we went downstairs and found ourselves in the subway system. And we stayed down there for a while, a gentleman from the subway um, network came, he was an employee, he took us to a locker room where there were other people. Um, and we all just kind of stood there together and sat on benches and so on and just waited until everything passed us by, until the debris was all settled and then a police officer came and he said, um, the air's clear up above, you're gonna have to leave and get out of here right now. So we followed him upstairs, we got outside and David looked around and said, oh my God, Mike, there's no Tower 2 anymore. And I said, what do you see? And he said, all I see are pillars of smoke, hundreds of feet tall. You sure there's no tower two? It's gone. We stood there and then we just walked west on Fulton Street for a ways. We just kept walking out of the area. And finally, we were in this little plaza area about 1029, 1030, when we heard that freight train waterfall sound again and we knew it was tower one collapsing. David looked back, saw a dust cloud coming, so we kind of moved to the side to get away from most of the dust, hunkered down, and just waited until everything passed us by. And when it was all gone, we stood up, David looked around, and he said, oh my God, Mike, there's no World Trade Center anymore. And I said, you're sure? And he said, yeah, it's all gone. You're sure? It's all gone. Go figure. Who would have thought? We had no clue what had happened, but it was gone. We stood there for a minute, and then I tried to call my wife, Karen, and this time I got through to her, and she's the first one who told us how two aircraft had been crashed into the towers, one into the Pentagon, and a fourth was still missing over Pennsylvania. We waited for a minute, and after saying goodbye to her, we just started walking, and we finally made it totally out of the area, and eventually, later that night, to just get through the story, I made it home about seven o'clock, and a friend of ours, Tom Painter, had come to be with Karen, and uh, drove her in our accessible van to the station to pick me up at seven. We got home. I took Roselle's harness off and instead of wanting to go outside, she went and grabbed her favorite tug bone and started picking a tug of war game with my retired guide dog, Linny. If that doesn't put September 11th into perspective, I don't know what does. 
The next day, I contacted Guide Dogs for the Blind, and we learned that um, the public information officer wanted to write an article about us, and a couple of days after that came out, the media got the story, and we had the first of five interviews on Larry King Live, which led to a number of people asking me to come and speak, and that continues to this day. So I worked for Guide Dogs for the Blind for six and a half years as their public spokesperson and the director of national public affairs, and then just went off and continued to speak. And four years ago, I began working with a company called Ira that makes a device called a visual interpreter. It's technology that literally allows me to get access to any visual information that I don't have access to. As I said before, the big problem that I typically have is that information isn't really made available to me. But it is something that we have to deal with and have to figure out how to get more access to data so I'm able to work and compete and live as effectively and as competitively as everyone else. Very quickly, I want to show you what the product is. It's called Ira, A-I-R-A. -A. What I'm allowed to do with Ira is I have a pair of glasses that have a smart camera. And the camera can see lots of stuff. And when I activate the system, Calling Ira agent. what happens is that it will contact a live agent who is trained to describe. And if Connecting you, to Agent Amy. Start we're gonna video. get Amy. Please wait. Thank you for calling Ira. This is Amy. What would you like to do today, Michael? I would like you to tell me something about what you see around us here. Uh, yes, currently it looks like you are in a big conference room. I see several rows of long rectangular tables in front of you. Like there are one, two, three, four rows of long rectangular tables in front of you currently. Um, I can see uh, at the very top, it looks like rows of blue lights. And um, hey. I can see all the way to the back of the room, it looks like there's a big exit door there. Hey, Amy, do any of these people, uh, look, do any of these people look like they're asleep? Uh, I don't see anyone sleeping. So okay, I'm good. Look up, so. <laughs> Can you tell where we are? Um, in theory, she's able to see yeah. through GPS where we are. Let's see if she's able to tell us. All right, let me go ahead and see if it pulls up on my map. This will sometimes just take a it moment. doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. That's still one of the areas that needs to be improved. If you can't, that's okay. Well, it looks like it's not pulling up on my GPS. Um, Sometimes it does yeah, and sometimes, know. okay, well, we won't worry about it. Well, I just wanted to show these people very quickly what Ira is capable of. So we're gonna disconnect uh -huh. and uh, I will find you later. All right, thank you, Michael, have a great day. Thank you. And what, what that allows me to do literally is to get any information. So like if I'm walking through airports, I'm able to um, use an agent to do things like find the Skylink at Dallas-Fort Worth. I can use it to create documents like PowerPoint presentations, make sure that things look good, and literally do any of the same things that you might do. Because as I said before, the big difficulty is that visual information is not necessarily made to be inclusive, because you guys aren't used to blindness. Um, and so with Ira, I get access to all of that. One of the things that we can do with IRA and is being done more and more is that organizations buy IRA time just like Starbucks buys Wi-Fi and makes Wi-Fi available to anyone in the world who comes into a Starbucks location. So companies can buy what's called IRA access and when they do that, then anyone who has a smartphone can have the IRA app on their phone, go into those locations and IRA is free for them to use because there is a subscription cost otherwise. But from a standpoint of people being able to access it, one of the things that we can do is sell IRA time. So for example, if you all had IRA access available at any of the Ohio Health Hospitals, any blind person could walk in and use IRA to find any of the, the places where they might need to go in the hospital, just like anyone else would be able to do. We could talk about privacy issues and all that, but suffice it to say, that's what IRA allows me to do, is to really gain the same level of access. That's our story. In, in short, um, the, the bottom line is any of us could be anywhere at any time. 
Unfortunately, we really have to be prepared to handle all sorts of different issues and emergencies. We never know when it's going to happen. And we all have to be as prepared as anyone else to be able to address those issues. So I wish we had more time, but I would like to see if anyone would like to ask a few questions. Just don't raise your hands because that won't work, unless there's going to be somebody who calls on. Anybody with a question? And don't be shy. It's not uh, tolerable and allowed to not ask questions. Oh, come on. No one? This is called a Braille Edge, which allows me, it's, it's what I use for notes, and so I was actually going to use it to very quickly read something at the very end today. Um, but it is what's called a paperless Braille display that allows me to create documents and literally um, read them just like you would read from a Palm Pilot or now we all use um, our phones to read things, but I want to read it in Braille, and this device allows me to do that. So there's a, a Braille display, 40 characters at a time, and I can, uh, can go off and read stuff. Next question. Yes. Yes. A lot of individuals, a lot of individuals have gone through much less than you and suffer PTSD. How did you manage to get out of that? And also, since your wife got the uh, wheelchair, you lost another job. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's okay. Um, sh I may, uh, she still reads, and instead of pushing, I make sure that her chair <laughs> continues to work. So I didn't lose another job, it just changed. You know, you gotta be able to be flexible and take new jobs as they come along. Um, PTSD, survivor's guilt, and so on, I don't think anyone could ever not totally be excluded from something like that. <clears throat> but I decided fairly early on, probably it's because I faced adversity before, the bottom line is that um, I'm here and I need to decide and accept that I'm here and recognize that what I need to do is to take advantage of and utilize the gift that I was given for being here. And I think one of the ways I get to do that is to be able to speak and do exactly what we're doing here today. Um, so. This is healthy for me. I, I hope that I'm able to help people, not only inspire people, but maybe teach them a little bit something different about people who are different than they, and hopefully help them move a little bit closer to recognizing we're all on the same spaceship and we all are capable. We may all have different gifts, but we're all capable, and we need to recognize that and not assume somebody is less than we are simply because we don't all have the same gifts. One more question? Anybody? No? <clears throat> no courage. OK, I'd like to end by reading you something from Thunderdog. By the way, Larry King wrote the foreword to Thunderdog. So I really hope you all will come out and buy copies, because we really don't want to take them home. And Alamo does want kibbles. <clears throat> this is from Guide Dog Wisdom, Lessons I Learned from Roselle on September 11th, and it goes like this. There's a time to play and a time to work. Know the difference. When the harness goes on, it's time to work. Work hard. Others are depending on you. Number two, focus in and use all of your senses. Learn to tell the difference between a harmless thunderstorm and a true emergency. Don't let your sight get in the way of your vision. Number three, sometimes the way is hard, but if you work together, someone will pass along a water bottle just when you need it. Number four, Roselle's favorite, always, but always kiss firefighters. <laughs> Number five, ignore distractions. There's more to life than playing fetch or chasing tennis balls. Number six, listen carefully to those who are wiser and more experienced than you. They'll help you find the way. Number seven, don't stop until work is over. Sometimes being a hero is just doing your job. Number eight, the dust cloud won't last forever. Keep going and look for the way out. It will come. Number nine, shake off the dust and move on. Remember the first guide dog command, forward. Number 10, when work is over, play hard with your friends and don't forget to share your favorite bow to bone. 
Thunderdog has been a number one New York Times bestseller. As I said, Larry King wrote the foreword, and um, I hope that you'll come out and get copies. It tells the story in a whole lot more detail than we have time for, but I really thank you for your time, and I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you all in breakout session later and doing other things. So thanks very much, and just work to help the good guys win. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.